Ladies and gentlemen, it's uh, a privilege and honor to have with us this morning, Rishad Premji, Chairperson, Wipro Limited. I'd like to request all of you to please give him a big round of applause as we welcome him to this event. And uh, moderating this fireside chat is Suman Gopalan, CHRO Freshworks. I'd like to invite both of them on, onto the stage. I'd like to hand the mic over to Suman. Good morning. All energized after yesterday's sessions. <laughs> it's, it's remarkable. One... There were 1,800 people here yesterday, which is incredible. I know. And it's so good to be back in in-person meetings. There's something to be said about the joy of meeting people in person, being able to exchange ideas, collaborate, all of that, which is what we're all here to do. So first and foremost, I want to say thank you to NASCOM for creating this platform for all the startups to come together. Uh, I know being part of one, what it means to actually be able to you know, learn from others and learn from you know, the mistakes that others have made, the good things that others are doing. So I do think it's wonderful that we're all able to be here today. Uh, I've been following the conversations that have been happening. And I know we talked a lot about you know, using technology and deep tech and you know, the uh, things that we can do uh, with technology. Uh, we've talked so much about what does it take to scale a startup. You know, we explored PLG, MLG, all of that. But I do think there is one crucial component to all of this. Besides technology, besides scaling the company, I think one of the most critical aspects of it is what is the kind of organization we want to build. And I think that's a topic that's on everybody's mind, especially as startup founders. And you know, building world class from India is actually not new. If you look around, we have so many great examples of it, Wipro being one of the foremost ones that we can all think about. So today as we explore what does it take to build world class organization, what does leadership look like? We can't imagine anybody else taking this chair, so thank you, Rishat, for thank joining for us today. Thank you for having me. It's wonderful yeah. to have you. And let's get started right away, and I want to start with the question that I alluded to, right? Uh, Wipro has been an organization that has led from the front the software revolution of India, right? And you've shown us what it takes to compete in a world-class uh, environment, in a global environment. Share with us a little bit about what does it take to succeed in a global environment? Mm -hmm. Like, what should we be thinking of? Yeah, you know, I think, uh, Suman, it's interesting because, you know, when tech services came out of India, it came out of India quite accidentally, right? I think a lot of companies got incredibly lucky. People were there. You know, we were all two, three hundred million dollars back in 97, 98, and we've all crossed, you know, 10 plus billion dollars today. And, you know, the one ingredient that matters is luck. You know, you have got to be at the right place at the right time. And there was a huge sh shortage of talent globally, and so that really helped the Indian context. But I think it's different today for young companies, and arguably it was uh, for us in terms of how we became international. But a couple of things that, that come to mind which I think are important as organizations think about how they grow and become big today. Because I get a chance to engage with a lot of young companies and there are incredible, incredible organizations and yours is one of them that's really reached global standards. But a couple of things that I think are important that as you think about how do you scale and how do you become big, whether it be big in India for India market or become big internationally. One is you know, I would say focus on building valuable businesses versus valuation, right? I find there's such an obsession today on unicorn status and how, you know, how much you're valued at. And the reality is the journey to build sustainable businesses is long, it's complex, it's slow at times. And if your journey is to make money quickly, the kind of organization you will build will be very different than an organization that you want to last. And I think it's incredibly important to think about valuable businesses versus valuation. So every time I meet a founder, that's the first thing I say. I honestly admit that if I meet a founder that says the first thing that's most important to him or her is making money, that turns me off a little bit because then their choices are going to be very sometimes myopic and, and short-sighted. So that's one big thing I think is incredibly important as you think about uh, long-term sustainability and differentiation. Right. The other is I think 
values for an organization start at the top and they start in the beginning. Right. Right? I think it's incredibly important you think about the kind of organization you yeah. want to build and the kind of DNA and environment you want to create. And that doesn't happen by accident. It happens very intentionally. So what you stand for, what you don't stand for is incredibly important. You know, I love this conversation I had with um, uh, a very, very successful founder. He now runs a sizable company that's almost a billion dollars in revenue. And very early on, when he was not a big company, he would get very senior leadership that he was hiring to come and do tech tests because he really wanted to be a tech company. He was selling a product, a physical product that all of us buy. And uh, some of the senior leaders said to him, you know, hey, look, you know, I'm too senior and I'm too big to be doing these tests. And he very politely would tell them, then this is probably the wrong place for you, right? So very clearly establishing what was important and what was not important in terms of the kind of organization you wanted to be. And the third thing I would say is surrounding yourself with incredibly strong people and incredibly good people and having the openness to surround yourself with people that are infinitely better than you, right. knowing that they're better than you, and having the humility to keep them and to encourage them and to, but really surrounding yourself with world-class people who very much resonate with your mission, with your passion, meeting the first two criteria, which is looking to build a valuable business and looking to sort of very much resonate with your values. So those are three things I would say that are incredibly important. I look for them when I look for, when I look at young companies, I look at these things closely. Right. I love what you said, you know, building value versus valuation. Uh, I think that's an incredibly important lesson for all of us because I do know that a lot of what gets talked about is unicorn, sunicorn status, but at the end of the day, what makes you successful is right. really the bedrock on which your company is built. So let me actually build upon that a little bit, right? When we talk about culture, usually we attribute that with larger organizations, right? And culture is something that when you become slightly larger, you want to talk about it more purposefully, all of that. When in fact, as you said, it is even more critical that startups which are really trying to attract the best and the brightest really define what kind of culture and values that they want to have. How did you go about doing that at Wipro? Like, yeah. how should we think about what does it take to build culture? What kind yeah. of value should we yeah. be thinking about? So, you know, I, I've spent a lot of time wrestling with this, right? And to me, culture is different from values, yep. right? Values are, at least at Wipro, they are the, 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 the lighthouse of the organization. They're the soul of the organization. They're the foundation of the organization, right? We've defined values since 1971, so this is our 51st year of defining values. We've moderated them you know, marginally over the last 50 years to make them a little bit more contemporary. But the big realization I had, which sounded like an aha, but it's really not an aha, so man, is people don't experience your values. They experience your behaviors. Right. And as a consequence of which they interpret whether you live your values or not, right? And Culture to me is values in action. Culture to me is values representing, uh, the, the behaviors representing those values. And so that's what we've spent a lot of time over the last uh, several years. And I particularly over the last three years have spent a lot of time in terms of how do we bring those values to life, right? So a very simple example is most organizations say one of their values is being respectful, right? It's quite common to see that in some shape and form in an organization. But how does that respect translate into behaviors? It translates into... Uh, uh, the way you conduct yourself, how polite are you, the kind of, you know, if you're rude and abrasive and use foul language, if you don't listen, if you are not inclusive, if you don't give feedback constructively to people, you're not demonstrating respect, even right. though you say you're a respectful organization, right? So how does that show up every day in organizations is, is incredibly, incredibly important. And the reality is all organizations have culture. So culture is not intentional. It's not purposeful. It happens. Right? And you can be intentional about what you want and what you don't want from culture. And I, my big learning has been that it, you have to lead it from the top. Right. What you do and what you demonstrate and how you live and conduct yourself deeply and very, very, very quickly permeates into the organization. And it's actually quite detrimental when what you say versus what you do don't match. Because people are observing you. You know, somebody taught me a life lesson about teaching values to children. And he said, you know, don't do anything. So I said, what do you mean don't do anything? I was very worried about the kind of children I was raising. And he said, they're observing you. Yeah. So they're observing you more than they're listening to you. And I think the same thing applies to organizations as well. People observe how leadership shows up and conducts themselves. 
Absolutely. Like, I think the saying goes, the camera is always rolling. Right. I think people are always watching. And as leaders, there's no off moment, right? right? Uh, whether you're having a water cooler conversation, you know, whether you're in the cafeteria, I think people observe and learn right. a lot more right. than PowerPoint presentations. Right. Uh, I want to build a little bit on what you just said, Drishad. Vipro has been an institution for a long time, right? In all our minds, one of the most successful companies. <coughs> and yet you say that you're on a journey to make Wipro a high-performing organization that is empathetic, that has a soul, that's vulnerable, collaborative, decent, all of that. What made you feel like you need a shake-up like this, right. right? As a leader, what makes you say that I need something different now. I need to take this company yeah. slightly differently. Because to all of us, it's very successful. Why yeah. change then? Yeah. You know, I think organizations need to rediscover and re-energize themselves one, right? And when you have a 75 or 77 year journey, you'll have ebbs and flows. You'll have years that are fabulous. You'll have years that are not so fabulous. You'll have decades that are fabulous. You'll have decades that are not so fabulous. And so when I was taking over as chairman of the company in 2019, you know, I felt that we had a little bit of a a, 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 a lost decade, right? We hadn't done well as to the potential we deeply believed right. that we had. And so one of the things I did is I spent a lot of time with our top leaders. And I said, look, I think we have decent ingredients. And why is that not showing up in a decent dish consistently, or at least for these last few years? And one of the feelings was that perhaps something was happening in the kitchen, something was happening in the way we came together right. that was making a decent, decent ingredients not produce a decent dish, right? And so we spent a lot of time trying to unpack that. And one of the things we came to is that we wanted to be much more purposefully high performance. And I'll tell you what I mean by the word high performance because different people can mean different things. But you know, how do you focus obsessively on outputs and outcomes? How do you not confuse output and outcome with input and loyalty? How do you build a strong DNA of risk taking and being bold and taking chances and learning to fail and being celebrating failures? How do you be growth obsessed? Right? How do you drive a very, very strong orientation to results, which is very assertive, right? and at the same time, create an organization that has a soul, right? so that is collaborative and comes together and is vulnerable and empathetic and, is so, you know, and cares about the communities in which it lives and breeds and all of those things. And I think they can coexist, because oftentimes people tend to think that if you're ruthlessly high performance, you are willing to leave as many dead bodies on the way uh, at the expense of everything else. And I don't think they can, I think they can coexist. So that's the journey we are on. You know, how do we build a very strong DNA of high performance? And so Thierry, our new CEO, who's been there for a couple of years, spends a lot of time on really driving that DNA and yet be an organization that is, uh, that is real, that is empathetic and vulnerable and unafraid to say I need help and unafraid to say I don't know. And all those kinds of things which I think are incredibly important uh, in, in large organizations, all organizations for that matter. How do matter. you bring this to life, right? right? I think all of us as startups aspire to do right. that, right? We want to build a high-performing organization, right. yet at the same time, right. something that has a soul. Right. You know, we are respectful, humble, yeah. all of that, but we're all learning to compete yeah. on a global stage, yeah. right? Yeah. No excuses. We've got to perform. How do you actually bring that to life? Like, yeah. How do you translate that into action? So one is there are no shortcuts, right? There really are no. Two, it's a journey. It's not a destination. So you never quite get there. You're always on this journey of, it's not like you've got to a result, right? You're never, you're never always there because you get new people coming into the organization all the time. So we very much quantify, qualify it as a journey. And it starts from the top. So I spend a lot of time with people just talking about these elements. So I will, you know, I have spent over 300 hours, I have done over 100 sessions, I have met over 30,000 of our colleagues from sessions as long, small as 25 people to sessions as big as 1,000 a, a people. So you've got to invest time and you connect with people. And frankly, this started before COVID, but in COVID it became a really powerful piece because you were not coming together in person. And we tell stories. You know, I've, the big learning I've had is people hate presentations and businessy stuff on a business presentation. It's boring, it's unappealing. Right. People like stories, people remember stories, so we tell stories and we're incredibly naked about being open to being punched, open to taking feedback, open to, to learning, and so it's, uh, it's incredibly exciting. So we're spending a lot of time on 
the way we show up and what matters as values. And at the same time, we say it's a necessary but not sufficient condition, right? So you need to live the values of the organization, which allows you to exist in the organization, but doesn't allow you to succeed in the organization. On top of that comes performance. And then we've tried to bring this to life, so man, in our people processes, because they have to have a strong element of how they show up. So they show up in our, in our salary increase process, they show up in our promotion process, they show up in our appraisal process, they show up in our talent review planning process. And it's interesting, especially when I talk about talent review, you know, we've been doing this for years, and we would look at the, you know, our top 1,000 people, and we would say, look, how do we rate these people? So we rate them on performance, and we rate them on potential for performance. And so we've added a third element now, which is what we call values, which is encompassing of culture and behaviors and all of those. And it's interesting when we talk about them, the first people we talk about that show up as yellow on, 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 the, on that element. So hey, they're doing a fa phenomenal job, but why are they showing up as yellow? And those are the most dangerous people in organizations, that the people who are incredibly successful, incredibly good, but leave a thousand dead bodies on the way while they succeed, right? And that's not sustainable, I think, in large organizations. It doesn't take you very far. It takes you to a certain point. So we're trying to be, and it's, it's not easy, by the way, right? And it's not easy, certainly in all, it's not easy in small organizations because you're very dependent on one or two people who make you incredibly successful. It's not easy in large organizations because sometimes they, they can hide in the system as well. But those are some of the things we are trying to do. It's, it's great to hear. Uh, ultimately, I think, you know, as they say, the rubber hits the road, right? right. Uh, great stuff that you can put on slides, on your walls, all of that. But I think people watch in terms of how do you really make decisions? Uh, how do you really bring it to life? And like you said, when you have high-performing team members that are not necessarily aligned to the value, how do you deal with that? I think it's a big aspect of culture. You talked about the fact that you personally spend a lot of time on this, right? right? And I think all founders and all CEOs, everybody over here has the same question. There are so many things we deal with, right? Especially in the startup world, we're trying to scale the company, we're focused on growth, we're focused on fundraise, we're focused on you know, getting the next-gen product out. And then there's also you know, this big aspect of culture that we are custodians of. How do you balance that as a leader? Yeah. No, you know, I have a little bit of an easier job because I'm the chairman and not the CEO of the company. So, you know, I'm not operationally running the company every day. So I definitely have that advantage. But look, I will say if something is important for the organization, you've got to carve out time to A, because it's important and because you want to communicate that it's important. So I, I, I'm a big believer, especially in, in, in many organizations that are people driven, you know, our people, which are our assets, effectively walk in and out every day, but they're not walking in and out every day because we don't have most of our people coming in yet, but, but that, that's what I mean. They just sort of, you know, they are the most critical people, and so spending time with them is, is incredibly, incredibly important, right? And two is as you get bigger as an organization, you get more and more disconnected from what's happening on the ground, and for me, this is an incredible way of just staying connected with right. what's happening in the organization because you get a real pulse of what's happening where the organization actually transacts. It doesn't transact where I sit, it transacts where a lot of our, you know, our mid-managers and, and below said they are the ones who make the organization. They are the ones who actually bring in the revenue right. every day. So it's incredibly important that they feel a very strong sense of, of belonging. Right? The other thing, Suman, that I've learned, which I find is incredibly powerful and I find it's changing quite disruptively over the last couple of years, is what matters to young people. Right? Many startups have young uh, people working in the organization. The average age at Wipro is between 28 and 29. And the kinds of things that matter today to people is very different than what mattered before. So the kind of questions are around things like, you know, what are you doing for the environment? What's happening on sustainability and how important that is? By the way, it's also important for customers because that's moved from page 40 of the RFP to the first five pages of the RFP, right? It's incredibly, incredibly an important conversation. The other is on just diversity. And diversity is the physical element of it, but inclusiveness is the mindset and how that shows up, right? And we've become very purposeful about that as well, because not because we want to meet metrics, but we really believe that diverse ideas bring incredible power to the table. I, I share this story often, which I'll share again. You know, I was having a chat a few years ago with one of our board members, and I was telling him, you know, when I'm looking to hire someone, 
Um, oftentimes, it, I'm looking to find commonality. I'm looking right. to find things I like about this person, right? Can I get along with this person? Can I have a drink within the evening? Can I have a cup of coffee with this person? And he said to me, Vishal, that's the completely wrong way to look for people. So I said, what do you mean? He said, you should be looking for people who are very different than you, yeah. who challenge you, who shake up the status quo, right? But are highly functional. But they make you uncomfortable. And I've had reportees in the past that made me highly uncomfortable. I'd be stressed when I was having a review with them, and it should be the other way around, right? But that's, I think, incredibly powerful in terms of the mindset you bring to the table. And it's deeply discomforting to people who are comfortable with a, a homogenous environment. But I really think it's incredibly powerful for, for the organization. And these are the kinds of things I find young people uh, deeply, deeply care about more and more. And then they care about, you know, are you an integral part of the communities? Do you give back? Do you contribute? Uh, and I think those things matter, and they will matter more and more as you move forward as well. Absolutely. I, I find it really interesting that the current generation is so much more uh, aware of how we show up as companies, right. right? It's not just a place to work anymore. I think they want to identify, they want to belong, and it takes much more than just building a big business to do that. You said something, uh, Rishad, that uh, I want to touch upon. The workplace is also evolving quite right. rapidly, right. right? Not just the generation that we are seeing, and obviously now we're seeing all of the remote work, four-day week, you know, so many different innovations that are happening in terms of where work happens right. and how we work. How does that impact culture? Because yeah. the way we have always seen culture evolve is, you know, a lot more in terms of how we show up, yeah. you know, how we work together, and it's very visible. Yeah. How do you bring that to life when probably half yeah. of the workforce is not even present in an yeah. office? No, it's incredibly hard, and I'll just share, you know, some statistics. We're about 260,000 people today as a company. We've had 100,000 new people join us in the last 30 months. We have less than... 10% of people coming in. We have maybe 30% of our people living in tier two, tier three cities, so they've gone back to their hometowns. Many people who've joined in those 100,000 people have never walked into a, to an office. So it's a huge challenge because, you know, how do you build a sense of belonging to an organization? Many of these people simply get a paycheck from the company and they engage with a few of their leaders, typically on a, on a collaborative medium, right? Uh, and so connectedness is, is lost at some level. And how do you drive that deep sense of connectedness is a is a big challenge. One of the ways we do it is through sessions like I talked about on culture and values where we connect with people, right, reaching right. out. But I, I'm a big believer, someone that belonging to, an, people stay for two reasons, right? People stay because they have a career path, they have great compensation, they leave because they can have a better career path or life cha lifestyle changing compensation, but they also leave and stay for, for because there is connectedness or a lack of connectedness. And I think it's incredibly, incredibly important to build that connectedness. And so I'm a big believer that people should come back. All of our people should come back some of the time. Right? So we don't want all of our people to come back all of the time. So we'll move to some sort of a, a hybrid model. Because organizations grow when people gossip. Organizations grow when people connect over coffee, connect over lunch, right. assimilate, and just get together and chat about business stuff, non-business stuff. It's, we're human beings. That's how we organically function. So it's incredibly important for that. I think it's also incredibly important for, for innovation. Because innovation does not happen, and ideation does not happen in a linear manner. It doesn't happen when you are done with the Zoom call. You know, I was with a customer yesterday, uh, and by the way, lots more customers are coming physically to meetings. And she was saying, you know, the, the, the magic of meetings is oftentimes what happens in the meetings. And then when you're leaving the meeting or entering the meeting, and those conversations that happen where oftentimes, sometimes decision making gets happened, sometimes just relationships get built. And those things don't happen on, on virtual mediums, right? So it's incredibly important that I think people, all people come back some of the time. And so that's, we, we're trying to get there. We're nowhere there. The other thing I want to caveat you know, that by also saying we are also going to be very agile. So we can't be dogmatic and fixated about this. You have to be quite adaptive in terms of how this evolves. But especially if you're a young company, if you're a startup, I think, and you're 30, 40 people, and you're all based in the same city, if you're not coming together, I think you're missing out on an amazing chemistry that can build. And one last thing on that, I think if you're a fresher, just graduate from college, if you're not coming into campus, again, you're missing out on an incredible opportunity to build a different experience of what work life actually means as opposed to what you think it means because you're working virtually. 
Absolutely. And I always say there is a joy of the workplace, right? right? Uh, otherwise, I think uh, it can get a little monotonous. When you go from, you know, one virtual meeting to another and, you know, you're just meeting people who, you know, you have to meet purposefully because of work. You don't accidentally have conversations with folks from other part of the organization. There's something to be said about the joy of being in a workplace, meeting with colleagues, going out for a coffee. You know, while it might seem like a lot of fluff, I do think it builds deep yeah. connections and network that go a long way. And especially as we talk about, you know, building world-class organizations, I'd only say that uh, companies have to be purposeful about it, right? Don't let it happen to you just because it is the next big thing that we are witnessing. A lot of companies are doing fully remote, partially remote, whatever. I'd say for every company, every founder, I think it's really key to think about what matters for you and what makes sense for your organization, right? Uh, and that is really critical. Because like you said, if you truly want to build a company that's lasting and where people enjoy working together, we need to find ways for them to come together as well, right? Uh, so I, I know it's agree. a hotly debated topic on everybody's mind, but I think the only lesson yeah. that we all have is, uh, you know, you just have to be purposeful and yeah. figure out what works for you versus what's popular. And you know, I think, Suman, one last point I'll add on this. I think it's quite unique to the tech industry. I look at lots of other businesses. You know, if I look at the consumer product industry, I look at some of the manufacturing companies, I look at the healthcare companies, just different industries. People are, 100% of their employees are coming back. So this, yep. this work, uh, this hybrid model of work or the debate around what the workplace of the future looks like is also, I think, to a great extent, quite unique to the tech industry. Uh, Particularly. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, uh, one other thing that I'm always fascinated by is Vipro is a company that's multi-generational, right? We're all building first-gen companies over here. Yeah. But here we have an example of a world-class company that's lasted generations, right? Tell us, what does it take to build a lasting organization? like that, because all of us are looking at it as we want to build companies that last beyond us, right. where we want to leave a legacy. Tell us a little bit about what does it take to create something like yeah. that? One, a lot of good luck, right? Most <laughs> importantly, a lot of good luck. You know, I always joke, I would much rather hire someone who is lucky than someone who is smart, <laughs> for sure, you know. <laughs> luck matters, luck matters infinitely in life. You know, people underscore the importance of luck tremendously. There's so many brilliant people out there and so many don't make it just because, you know, somebody else got lucky. So luck matters tremendously. Look, I think being uncompromising on what matters to you as an organization. So, you know, we defined very early, for example, when it was not fashionable, you know, back in, we started in 1946, we're older than the independence of India. And the, the, the governance on which we built the organization, the sense of integrity on which we built the organization was more important than anything else, than everything else, right? So. Uh, that became the foundation and the soul of the organization. And so, so defining what is important and what is, will stand the test of time, even if that means compromising on performance, even if that means uh, taking the tough call. And you take the tough calls when things are not easy, right? We had to uh, let a very senior person, top 20 person in the organization go because there was a huge integrity violation. And we made that decision in 10 minutes. And it was an important role that this person ran for the organization. But when the times are tough and you have to make those tough calls is when the muscle of the organization gets built and the memory of the organization gets built. And so I would say defining what is incredibly uncompromising for you as an organization, uh, and that should stand the test of time because they are timeless at some level, is uh, uh, one thing that I think has helped us as an organization. So. I love that. And I think that's a valuable lesson for all of us in startups, that there is no shortcut to success. Right. Right? When you look at it in retrospect, it seems like you know, it was an easy journey. But I think what you really said is if you truly want to build something that's lasting, if you truly want to build something that's world class, it not only takes a lot of hard work and luck, I do think it takes defining the purpose and the values way beyond you know, the business model and everything else that comes with it, right? right. So I know, Rishad, you and I can go on and right. on. Uh, there are lots of I think it's screaming at your time's up. I know, I'm seriously, okay. I saw that, <laughs> and that's what. Uh, but I want to see if there are a couple of questions from the audience, because I know lots of them are eager to ask you right. questions as well. So maybe we'll have time for a couple. 
uh, before we wrap up. I think there's a gentleman in front who wants to. Hi, Rishad. How are you? Good. How are you? Good to see you. Uh, I must say I'm one of those lucky guys, as you defined, and was fortunate to work with Mr. Premji, your dad, for a couple of years, and privileged too. So I think it was probably my luck which attracted him, and I'm sure you guys share the same values. So I was really privileged, and I'm a lucky guy to have worked with him. That's one. But coming specifically to what you said, that as advised by some of your well-wishers, I'm sure, you decided to have your team members who were probably different from you, smarter than you, and uh, that gave you stress during reviews while it should have been yeah. otherwise. How did you handle that stress, which was your own creation? Yeah. No, you know, I, I also, I, 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 you know, I, I'm in a bit of a privileged position and I very much acknowledge that. It's easier for me than for many other people and I very much acknowledge that. But I think, look, having the humility to, to, to recognize that, right? I think oftentimes, I'm always very confused when I meet people who think they're here and everybody around them thinks they're here. I'm very, it makes me very nervous because you're obviously disconnected from how people actually perceive you and I'm always uh, looking out for that. So I've, I, I've always, I think, been quite attuned to uh, my, my capability and where that g goes up to and so I'm sort of offset for that by surrounding myself with good people and then having the humility to accept that and giving them the autonomy, giving them the respect, giving them the opportunities both in terms of career progression, giving the, um, the opportunities in terms of uh, monetary success in the organization. I think those things matter tremendously, right? Uh, as somebody said to me that your job, you know, somebody said this to me, leaders are not in charge of things. They are in charge of people who are in charge of things. Right? And so your job is to get people who are in charge of things, keep them going and keep them excited and keep them motivated. So I spend 40% of my time with people because that's the most important thing for me. Right? How do we get really smart people to stay, to be energized? Uh, and I think that's important even if you're a young company. How do you get really smart people uh, to stay? Because you can have an amazing leader, but if you have an ordinary team, I think that falls apart after a time. And you can see that in some successful young companies as well that perhaps are struggling a little bit because they don't have that combination working well, I think. So lastly, means, uh, as, again, I'm repeating myself. I've worked with Mr. Premji closely. I see you very, very similar to what he was or he is. And how do you change a culture of an organization? Because I think he set standards and values, which yeah. is very difficult. Yeah. There's no need to change, according yeah. to me. No, so we're not changing our values. We're changing the well, way we show up as an organization. No, as I said, it's, it's hard, first of all. It's yeah. not, it's a, we've been on this journey for the last three years. You connect with people. You spend time with people. I wish there was an aha. I wish I had an aha. There is no aha. It's slow and steady. You know, I mean, there are great examples out there. I think Microsoft is a phenomenal example of an organization that's transformed in the last eight, nine years under Satya, Satya's leadership. So I think there's, there's great examples of how organizations can change. The elephant can dance. But it takes time, and it takes consistency, and it takes commitment, I think, from the top. So, Thank thanks. you so much. Good. Thank you. So I'll take the privilege of sitting next to you yeah. <laughs> before the time runs out. So my question to you would be in continuation with his question. Uh, when you talk, talked about having a heterogeneous team with you, wherein you know, people's mindset do not match as your mindset, so let's just take, for example, if I'm heading a company and there are multiple managers or directors, there, is all, there are always managers having their favorite reporters and then there are always LOB heads and VPs having their favorite people. How do you make sure sitting at the top that that particular perspective is basically taken, you know, like uh, top to bottom yeah. and people don't really promote or, uh, you know, their favorite people, yeah. but people with different mindsets yeah. and having a challenging, uh, you know, yeah. because that seldom happens. Yeah. So what you're pointing out is not, is a very common phenomenon. It happens with, as human beings. It's not unique to a small or big company. I think it's, again, being very, very uh, purposeful from the top, right? So it's saying if you have a diverse team or you have a, a non-homogenous team with people that come with very different experiences, gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation, everything, just a very, very diverse team, by design, their teams will also end up being that way. So you start from the top. Now, in organizations where it is quite homogenous at the top, and you want to try and drive it, you can try and drive it from the top, but you can also drive it from the bottom. So you know, how do you set aggressive, unreasonable goals sometimes from the bottom? You, know, you want to promote and support diversity. You don't want it to, these are not tokenisms, they're not hand-me-downs, because nobody wants to get a job because they met a quota. But how do you be very purposeful 
about driving that. One of the things we are doing at Wipro, for example, is spending a lot of time with people in unconscious biases, right? We're spending a lot of time with people to just even make them aware of what they don't even know they're biased about, right? And that's, so again, it, it takes time, and it can be noisy, and it's not easy, but I think, I think it can be incredibly powerful. And I will tell you, you know, I'll give you a simple example. You know, we, had, we walked into a, I heard the story about walking into a customer situation in our business, a global customer, and there were eight people in that room from, from the company's side, and there was one woman, and the customer was a CIO, she was a woman, and her first comment was, are you joking, right? So, I mean, that, you were already biased again, so it's becoming also a business need more and more, especially for, for companies like many of you as well who serve global customers, that your customers will demand this incredibly. So it's not only going to be a choice now, it's going to be a requirement, I think, and so I, I think it will dramatically change in the next three to five years. Good. Hi, Rishad. Probably have time yeah, for one last question. You're in charge, yeah. so. R Rishad? Yeah, hi. Hi. Question. They've, they've turned your mic off, I think. <laughs> Good. Um, hi, um, my name is Sudhakar. I run a company called TRST Score. I, I can't see you though, but I'm like. Right here. Oh, okay. Okay. So, okay. This is. This is. This is Wh whose this mic is, is working? Okay, mine, mine is working. Yeah. All right. Mine is so, also working. Mine is working, I get the chance. All right, we will, <laughs> we will come to you. We will not end with this question. How you about don't that? Work. <laughs> don't worry. We can eat your life. Great. So I run a company called TRSD Score, which is looks at employee uh, integrity and trust. That's what it looks like. So how do you build an organization and culture with the, with the kind of integrity and uh, trust that employees need to have? Yeah. Having zero tolerance for it. I will tell you, and I say this in our culture session, that there's two things, you know, for our, our, all that I talked about in terms of our, our, our culture and our behaviors, it's a journey, not a destination. But there is there's a zero-one policy for any form of integrity violation, any form of harassment. You can be me in the company and I won't have a job if I violate one of those two. And we're very, very purposeful. And I gave an example of a very senior person. So we're absolutely black and white. And, you know, and it's remarkable how many things will come up you know, I, I, I remember that we had a, uh, uh, somebody many, many years ago who was just violating. They were not showing, this is like about six, seven years ago, they were not, they were getting somebody else to actually tag in for them in those days when you were tagging in and out. And we find that out and the person got fired effective immediately. And, you know, this person was well connected, reached out through every form of medium to put a lot of pressure on the organization to give him a clean relieving certificate, and we said, no, we're black and white about this. So you've got to be black and white, and you've got to be black and white when times are hard, because that, that those messages and those stories, stories float across the organization very, very quickly, both good and bad stories. So how you show up on those elements, I think, is, is incredibly important, and even more so when things are very difficult and not easy. Thanks, yeah, Rishad. So, uh, hopefully my mic is working now, so yeah. thank you, sir. Uh, for sharing this. Um, I'm Paris Goel, I'm the founder of Field Marshall SEM. I was, my ex-employer is Amazon. So I, I was hopefully working for the largest workforce. I, uh, and my question to you is, uh, what COVID-19 has taught many organizations that it taught Amazon as well, was that how do you become relevant? How do you become relevant in the changing times where COVID-19 taught every, every CHRO, every CXO uh, to care about their employees, right? When, uh, the connection with the employees became imperative and not just uh, means to float a paper by HR folks, right? Uh, and this, uh, this is a common phenomenon, not just in Amazon, but Google, Microsoft, any, I'm sure, in your company as well. So how do you actually walk the talk, right? Because people, uh, many CHROs, including yourself, ma'am, uh, will say that we are purposeful, we are profit for our purpose, and we want to connect with the employees, but hardly there are any organizations, and I'm saying this with utmost sincerity and utmost dedication, yeah. there are hardly any organization which will sincerely walk the talk. Yeah. No, it's, it's, first of all, it's not easy, right? And you've got to be very, again, very thoughtful about it. I will tell you, we, we try to spend a lot of time in the initial days of COVID about just truly showing up for people. You've got a lot of our managers to call our teams and just actually check. You know, one of the best pieces of advice I got from a customer, actually, he said, you know, he would spend every two or three weeks calling up all his direct reports for five minutes each, and he would simply call them up and say, hey, look, I have no agenda. I'm just going to see how you're doing. 
how your family is doing, if I can be helpful to you in any way, if the organization can be helpful to you in any way. And he said, those five minutes with 15 direct reports, 75 minutes every three weeks built more equity for me with my team than we've ever built as an organization. So we've, have we succeeded all the time? No, but we've tried to do some of those kinds of things. The other thing we've become very vocal and uh, ex vocal about talking about is mental wellness, right? And how do we, that's become a big, big element in conversation. So it's not only about how are people doing, how are people feeling, it's okay not to be okay, right? And talking about that and having different media, different optional things in the organization that people can leverage to help with that. So we've tried that. Have we succeeded fully? I would argue no. But I think we've become much more conscious about well-being of employees now. And I think hopefully most companies have living through COVID. Yeah? yeah. Thanks. And just to add on to what you said, right, there are all kinds of companies out there, and there'll always be, right? And if you truly want to build an organization that stands out, that is world-class, I think those are the organizations you'll find not only have great products, great business model, these are the ones that have great values and culture that guide their business, right? And so, yeah, you're right. There are many companies that don't walk the talk, all of that, but you won't find them in the list of greats, right? So as all of you are setting out, you're a founder now, and you're building out your own company, I think that is what you should think about a lot more, or even more than, you know, what kind of product or service or business model that you have. And I think that's a valuable lesson for all of us over here. It's a great way to end. Yes. Yeah. So thank you, Rishabh. Thank you so much. Wonderful having thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to thank both uh, Rishad and Suman for that very candid and open discussion on leadership lessons for startups. Thank you, Rishad, once again.